Today we have the pleasure to have with us UTSA Professor Dr. Arturo Montoya, who is working on a NASA contract in collaboration with Purdue University to design and operate resilient deep space habitats that can adapt, absorb, and rapidly recover from expected and unexpected disruption. Dr. Montoya holds a dual appointment as an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Mechanical Engineering at UTSA. Welcome, Dr. Montoya. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm here to talk about the Resilient and Extraterrestrial Habitats Institute, or as we like to call it, REP Institute which started operating last fall under NASA funding. This uh, institute will complement other NASA efforts and industry efforts on this same uh, topic. So what is our vision? Our vision is to enable smart and resilient space habitats. And we plan to do it by developing new knowledge, providing new techniques and technology that we feel that are essential for establishing smart and resilient habitats. These habitats need to withstand long periods of dormancy, but yet they have to be fully functional when you have human crews presence. We plan to collaborate with industry and also we plan to interact with NASA and get some of their database. So this is our team. We are formed by four uh, universities, which are Purdue University as the lead, University of Connecticut, Harvard University, and the University of Texas at San Antonio, which I'm part of. And we have two uh, industry partners, which are Collins Aerospace and ILC Dover. And this is our team. Uh, we are 20 faculty, and we are led by Professor Shirley Dyke, uh, professor at Purdue University with a background in civil and mechanical engineering, but that has been working on the concept of uh, space habitats for the past 10 years. And besides the faculty, we are going to be supported by our students and our postdoc fellows. So what are our objectives? Our overarching objective is to establish a resilient framework for deep space habitats. And for that, you need to anticipate and detect uh, damage. You need to be able to respond whenever you have damage, so you need some robots uh, coming into place. And at the same time, we plan to educate the future uh, workforce of the space industry. So what are gonna be the benefits of this project? So we're gonna develop technologies and techniques that are gonna enable smart and resilient habitats. Uh, we're going to develop new decision uh, tools uh, that will let the uh, robots when to act and what to do. Um, and we're going to be interacting with our industry partners. And at the same time, we expect that the students that are part of the project will become future leaders of future research topics in the space uh, industry. So our research team is divided into three trusts. And we like to think of them as three protected layers. The first is the system uh, resilience trust, which we call resilience trust. And in that trust, we are brainstorming of what can go wrong. So there are many things that can go wrong. Uh, some of them, we know them. So we know radiation, uh, micrometeorite impact. Uh, we have huge uh, temperature fluctuations. And we need to be prepared on how to respond to those situations. And it's more uh, um, essential to know what to do because time will be uh, a big factor. It's not like here on Earth when something goes wrong, you go to the hardware, buy uh, some tools, and you go make some repairs. In here, it's like having a toolkit prepared for many things that can go wrong. And then we have the awareness trust that they sense and anticipate when things can go wrong. And finally, our robotics trust that they're going to intervene when something goes wrong or before it goes wrong. So why resiliency? That's uh, one of the words in our institute, resiliency. 
And if we look at the aerospace industry, uh, we have been using uh, risk analysis and risk management, and they are very effective, uh, but they try to minimize the probability of failure uh, to a very small percentage. But why does that not apply in uh, deep space habitat? Because it will be very costly to have nothing going wrong. So we need to be resilient, which means that we can lose some functionality, but we can still operate. But we're going to bounce back and recover our functionality in a timely manner. Uh, so we anticipate that disruptions are going to be inevitable and yet difficult to predict and that humans not, will always be present, but still our uh, deep space habitats need to be operational. So let's look at this uh, and how we're gonna come up with our resilience uh, framework. So in systems safety engineering, it has a culture of introducing safety to the design from early stages all the way to deployment and operation. Aerospace engineering, as, was, as I was mentioning, try to minimize the probability of failure and in civil engineering, we anticipate that structures will have to face some uh, hazards such as earthquakes and hurricanes, but they still need to be operational after those events. So we're going to merge all those techniques and come up with our three layers of defense, which are prevention, mitigation, and intervention. So we like to put them in a ladder because first we need to know what's gonna go wrong, and what are the hazards and the consequences of those hazards. In order to uh, respond to them and take decisions and send some robots to uh, do some actions of repairs. But as we go through our research, we'll find out that actually the robots actually are gonna help us develop our awareness system, and our awareness system is gonna help us develop our resiliency uh, framework. So how we're we going to start our work? We're going to start it with a reference implementation. And this is a, a process uh, from start to finish that's going to let us know what are the capabilities that we need to develop in order to come up with this resiliency framework. So we don't want to start with a very complicated uh, structure because we're going to be looping around in order to reach our objective. So we want to be able to start with a simple structure that we can analyze from start to finish. So to avoid any of this looping, but find what is that process that's needed to build research capabilities. It's also very important to start with a simple uh, structure because we come from different backgrounds and we talk different languages. So as we go through this process, we're going to find some common language and terminologies. And we're going to establish a framework for developing more accurate models along the way. So our reference implementation starts with a simple single dome style structure. And this structure is going to have four subsystems, although we know that there are many more. And they're going to be the environmental subsystem, the thermal subsystem, the structural, and the power. And we're going to be developing physics-based models for each of these subsystems, which are pretty much mathematical representations that tells you how the structure responds to operational stimuli and inputs from other subsystems. We're going to start with these models as being uncoupled in order just to learn from their physics. But then as we go through the process, we're going to couple uh, these models. And this reference implementation is going to let us know which of those connections are essential and what data needs to be transferred from one model to the other. So this is the uh, reference implementation scene from a thermal management perspective. So we want to ensure that the temperature is adequate uh, within the dome at all times. And for that, we're going to have different models that they interact with each other, and they send uh, information to the health management system, which then, based on the information that it gets, it sends uh, the robots to perform some repairs and some maintenance activities. So our model development, it's an incremental process. Uh, we start with simple models, and we refine them along the way as we gain confidence in our models. So there's a process of verification and, and calibration, and also of coupling and integrating the different 
models eventually validated them in a cyber physical test bed that I'll be discussing uh, in a few slides, and then finally our deployment. So for example, this is a simple 2D structural model uh, that we have started working on. And let's see if I can play it from here. Okay, there, there we go. So this is just a simple 2D model of uh, the thermal model and the structural model. And they are communicating uh, with each other. So the temperature model uh, informs of the temperature to the uh, structural model. And the structural model calculates the thermal stresses. And so this is just uh, some uh, uh, initial runs that we have been working on in order to see what are those stresses in the structure that we need to design for. And eventually, uh, we're preparing our codes for uh, a cyber physical test bed in which these codes need to run in real time. So they need to be very efficient codes. And then as we progress, we're gonna uh, develop more complicated models and we're gonna go to uh, 3D models. This reference implementation is also gonna tell us how to work together and how we can merge the codes. As these models are being developed by different researchers, but eventually they have to come to a single uh, platform. And we're learning how to do that through this uh, process. And then how do we incorporate the data from the monitoring system and how we predict performance using that data and then we uh, inform the robots and, and how the robots take some action and how that robot actions, it's fed back to our com uh, computational system. So through this research implementation, uh, we're gonna be able to answer some questions that I have listed some here. Uh, so for example, after a period of, of dormancy, what safety controls are relevant to ensure that the habitat ramps up safely? Or for a given cost, which is the more resilient option for minimizing damage due to micrometeorite impact? Then uh, we're going to move on to a cyber physical test bed. Not everything can be modeled, not everything can be tested, but we can integrate this too in order to understand better the behavior of our uh, structures. And so we're going to have two test beds. One of the test beds is going to be at Purdue, the second test bed is going to be at UConn. And, uh, you're gonna, we're gonna be performing uh, cyber physical simulations in which we combine the information from a physical model with the uh, models uh, that are run uh, uh, virtually. So what do we plan to accomplish uh, with the test bed? We plan to collect high quality data to inform models, examine the interconnections among subsystems, validate concepts, approaches, tools, and algorithms, to create smart habitats, uh, but overall we want to test ideas and just learn as much as possible. So right now we're in the process of designing uh, the test bed and we've been asked, just tell us what you think you can, uh, or just design an experiment. Don't think about cost at this moment, but eventually based on everybody's desire, we're going to come up with a, a test bed. So this is our year one goals. So the uh, funding lasts five years. Uh, so right now we're on our first uh, year. And during this first year, we plan to uh, identify the hazards and disruptions that can occur in deep space habitat. So for the last summer, we had student brainstorming on what can go wrong in a deep space habitat system. And then based on that, what actions will be needed in order to prevent uh, a serious accident. Uh, we are gonna identify safety controls, uh, or we're designing the cyber physical test bed. Uh, we're creating this computational platform in which we're gonna merge all the codes that are developed. We're gonna identify different uh, scenarios and <coughs> faults and disruptions. And we're gonna assess potential of soft robotics. So uh, we plan to do much more things in this five years, so I encourage you to follow our work. We have already launched a website. Uh, this is the website. 
and there we're going to be posting our latest uh, work, and uh, you can contact us if you have uh, any questions. I don't know if we have uh, time for, for questions. Do we have questions? Like, anybody has a burning question? Yes. Up there. What's the value of running a full coupled finite element model in real time instead of just like approximating some sort of control model to it? Why? Um, so we want to do. Uh, so there's two types of coupling, right? So there, there can be a sequential couple, or they can be uh, whenever you have very uh, nonlinear interactions, right? So actually, that's the reference implementation of what we're trying to answer. Is there really a need to go through highly computational uh, cost of the simulations, or do we just simplify it? And actually, uh, I didn't go over all the details, but we start with uh, a full uh, physical high reliable model. But then eventually, for real time, you have to go to a reduced order model. So we're going to go through that process just uh, to time I omitted some of the uh, details. Yes. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your environmental model. Do you use any type of um, ecological systems, like the introduction of plants or things like that? Uh, in this environmental model, the one that I showed there is just based on the uh, lunar temperatures and the interaction with the environment. Uh, the agricultural unit is going to be another subsystem of the habitat, which is not included as the first, uh, uh, I guess, test case, but it will be included later on. Thank you.